Greetings. My name is Dr. Reena Ramdev and I teach literature at a Delhi University College in New Delhi, India. This is a lecture that was prepared as part of the One Asia Foundation and its broader theme of sustainability, ethics and social responsibility in cross-cultural dialogues One Asia community with Europe. Owing to the changed global conditions that now inform not just our travel but our everyday living because of the global pandemic, the coronavirus, I am unable to be there in Spain to deliver the lecture in person. And here we are connected by the wonders of the virtual world, though apart and separated by miles and distance. And yet I am deeply aware that in-person teaching and our inter-bodily dynamic will suffer as will much of what would have been possible in an interactive exchange. But within our constraints, I do hope I will be able to convey some of my explorations of Arundhati Roy's political work and the place it holds in present-day history. In a recent April 3rd, 2020 article for the Financial Times, Arundhati Roy talks of the many crises that the COVID pandemic is a portal to. For apart from the health crisis, the hunger and the hatred crises are those that are brought upon a people by the state. In India, millions of daily wagers, migrant workers who worked in cities were suddenly, with the enforced lockdown, left incomeless and homeless. Walking hundreds of miles, many barefoot, straddling children to reach their villages, there were deaths on the way deaths that will never be accounted for within COVID statistics. As she says, the lockdown worked like a chemical experiment that suddenly illuminated hidden things. As shops, restaurants, factories and the construction industry shut down as the wealthy and the middle classes enclosed themselves in gated colonies, our towns and megacities began to extrude their working class citizens, their migrant workers, like so much unwanted accrual. Many driven out by their employers and landlords, millions of impoverished, hungry, thirsty people, young and old, men, women, children, sick people, disabled people, with nowhere else to go, with no public transport in sight, began a long march home to their villages. Thus, in the starkest of ways, the pandemic is exposing structural problems of egregious injustice and inequality, all of which will only increase and always with the heaviest toll on the poor and the politically vulnerable. The reason Roy says the pandemic is a portal is because she warns of how authoritarian states across the world will mobilize this moment's panic to try and increase surveillance and control and increase privatization and the gulf that already separates classes. Arundhati Roy's voice has been vilified for just such prescient warnings that she's been sending out in her political essays now for more than two decades. In the year 1997, when India was celebrating 50 years of independence from British rule, Arundhati Roy's first novel, The God of Small Things, created a literary stir when it went on to win the Booker Prize. Until then, Roy was little known in media circles except within a niche audience familiar with her screenplay for the 1989 indie cult film called In Which Annie Gives It Those Ones and also the 1992 film Electric Moon both of which she had acted in as well. In 1994, after graduating from architecture school, she had also written a polemical repost criticizing a film made on India's notorious bandit Poolan Devi. She accused the film Bandit Queen of transforming Poolan Devi from being India's best known bandit into history's most famous victim of rape. The God of Small Things went on to put Roy on India's literary map and continues to remain an important inclusion within the post-colonial canon. This especially so for its raising of issues of caste and untouchability and women and sexual desire. 
translated into more than 30 languages, the novel has until now sold over 6 million copies. Although, as she says impishly, people don't know how to deal with it. They want to embrace me and say that this is our girl. And yet, they don't want to address what the book is about, which is caste. They have to find ways of filtering it out. And since the novel centers around the experience of a set of young twins, they have to say it's a book about children. The Western media lavished high praise on her writing. A novel of real ambition must invent its own language, and this one does, John Updike wrote in his lush review in The New Yorker, going on to hail Roy's novel as a Tiger Woodsian debut. When she won the Booker, the global marketing machinery spun into overdrive, publicizing the advance she received of $1 million, unheard of in India for a debut novel at that time. Along with a comprehensive campaign to applaud her book at the 50th anniversary of India's independence, a high octane media offensive gushed over the brilliance of her debut, and the Indian public feted and celebrated her while also fetishizing her looks, her diamond nose pin, and her fairy tale success. All of which had, as she says, a sort of cloying Reader's Digest ring to it. The public applause soon turned to shock when in 1998, after India detonated its thermonuclear device, she wrote a scathing attack in an essay titled The End of Imagination. It is this public denunciation that marks Roy's emergence as political gadfly, as India's beat noir, a voice unafraid of asking difficult questions and dissenting against state policies. In her essay since then, she has framed her writing within political projects and struggles, exposing India's neoliberal collusions with global capital, its state agendas that promote big dams and nuclearization, and its active patronage of the now resurgent Hindu right. The years between her novels, she, is constant, she was constantly asked about her return to fiction and after India's nuclear testing, she publicly expressed her impatience at the expectation of a return to novel writing. As she says, the last question every visiting journalist always asks me, are you writing another book? That question mocks me. Another book? Right now, when it looks as though all the music, the art, the architecture, the literature, the whole of human civilization means nothing to the monsters who run the world. What kind of book should I write? For now, just for now, for just a while, pointlessness is my biggest enemy. That's what nuclear bombs do, whether they are used or not. They violate everything that is humane. They alter the meaning of life. Her searing indictment of India's nuclear testing was passionate and seen as a betrayal, as she says, quote, the nuclear bomb is the most undemocratic, anti-national, anti-human, outright evil thing that man has ever made." Unquote. Since the writing of The God of Small Things, the promise of a second novel remained in deferral for decades, and it was only in 2017 that she published The Ministry of Utmost Happiness, even as her political essays continued riling nationalist publics in India. When she received the Booker Prize money, Roy had gone on to donate all of it to the Narmada Bachao Andolan or the NBA, India's longest running anti dam grassroots movement that comprises Adivasis, who are India's native tribals, along with farmers, environmentalists, and human rights activists, all fighting to save the river Narmada and their homes and livelihoods from the construction of a dam. After India, independent India's first Prime Minister Nehru's famous Dams are the Temples of Modern India speech, dam building grew to be equated with nation building. This in turn led not only to an increase in the number of big dams, but also disestablished the older traditional systems that had been managed by village communities for thousands of years. Now allowing them to only atrophy, stripped as they were of their own organic evolutionary dynamic. In her 1999 essay, The Greater Common Good, Roy took on the dam industry, 
highlighting the human costs of the privatization of India's power supply and the construction of monumental dams in India. With numbers and statistics and her poetic prose, she challenged the idea that only experts can influence economic policy. As she says, quote, Instinct led me to set aside Joyce and Nabokov to postpone reading Don Delilo's big book and substituted with reports on drainage and irrigation with journals and books and documentary films about dams and why they are built and what they do. Continuing with her expose, she says, according to a detailed study of 54 large dams, the average number of people displaced by a large dam is 44,182. Admittedly, 54 dams out of 3,300 is not a big enough sample. But since it's all we have, let's try and do some rough arithmetic. A first draft. To err on the side of caution, let's half the number of people. Or let's err on the side of abundant caution and take an average of just 10,000 people per large dam. It's an improbably low figure, I know, but never mind. Whip out your calculators. 3,300 into 10,000 is equal to 33 million. That's what it works out to. 33 million people displaced by big dams alone in the last 50 years. The dam building industry in the first world is in trouble and out of work, so it's exported to the third world in the name of development aid, along with their other waste like old weapons, superannuated aircraft carriers and banned pesticides. Roy's writings and interventions in public debates have brought her a readership beyond what the novels cultivate as their publics. Her contravention of the diktat upon writers of fiction to only speak through their novels has spawned an entire industry that debates and laments the novelist's decision to write political essays. Her straddling of the two kinds of writing had then earned her the appellation writer-activist, which, as she had said, made her feel like a sofa bed. This is what she says, I don't see a great difference between the god of small things and my works of non-fiction. As I keep saying, fiction is truth. I think fiction is the truest thing there ever was. My whole effort now is to remove that distinction. The writer is the midwife of understanding. It's very important for me to tell politics like a story, to make it real, to draw a link between a man with his child and what fruit he had in the village he lived before he was kicked out and how that relates to Mr. Wolfenshon at the World Bank. That's what I want to do. The God of Small Things is a book where you can connect the very smallest of things to the very biggest, whether it's a, the dent that a baby spider makes on the surface of water, or the quality of moonlight on a river, or how history and politics intrude into your life, your house and your bedroom. Dismissive thus of any charter of duties imposed upon the writer by the reading public or the righteousness of any social claim, Roy says she writes as a concerned citizen, rejecting orthodoxies that attempt defining and circumscribing writers and writing. The only difference she sees between fiction and non-fiction is simply that between urgency and what she cites as eternity. For a novel can cogitatively brew for years decades, but a political essay's intervention comes from an urgency. She says, imagine if there's this little black book, a sort of approved guide to good writing that said, all writers shall, political, shall be politically conscious and sexually moral, or all writers should believe in the joys of family life, unquote. Criticized by nationalists who saw her criticism of the Indian state as a betrayal, she has also ruffled the feathers of the likes of the Indian historian Ram Guha, who had attacked her for straddling what he saw as two separate worlds of creative writing and activism. This was, in the main, the sort of purest indictment that her writing had faced in the early days. This is Ram Guha's quote, he says, I am told that Arundhati Roy has written a very good novel. Perhaps she should begin another. Her retreat from activism 
would use to use a term from economics be Pareto optimum, good for literature and good for the Indian environmental movement, unquote. Reviewers like Anil Nair brought it down to a sexist typification. He says, a novelist should feel responsibility only to the comely shape of a sentence. No writer of stories should aspire to be a champion of morals because she is simply not trustworthy or steady enough for that, unquote. Her prose in the essays was dismissed for being poetic and despite the detailed statistical backing she grounded her work in, the numbers and figures were still seen as those spun off a novelist's craft. Roy was also accused of hijacking the NBA's decades-long resistance as also for a behalfism that her work on the anti-dam resistance sought to highlight. But as she says in her defence, you can't expect the critique to be just Adivasi. You isolate them like that, and it's so easy to crush them. In many ways, people try to delegitimize the involvement of the middle class, saying, How can you speak on behalf of those, those people? No one is speaking on behalf of anyone, she clarified. And blinkered in her criticism of an India that, as she says, quote, invented the caste system and one that celebrates the genocide of Muslims and Sikhs and the lynchings of Dalits, unquote. She also cites and acknowledges it for being, quote, the land of poetry and mad rebellion, haunting music and exquisite textiles. This bilateral positioning is vintage Roy, marked by the unflinching continuities of her dissensual political critique in non-linearities that steer away from an uncritical aligning with the Indian nation-state, contra her imbrication in its affective communities and the intimacies that flank her activist involvement in the struggles she lends her voice to. A political engagement in the first place avows an act of faith, and as a dissident, the liminal space between belonging and rebuffing is one that L Roy has long negotiated. The dangers also lie in assigning a Socratic idealization to dissidence, from where it can quite easily and comfortably settle itself into baggy relativity. The patriot nationalist glorifies the nation and the dissident believes in the possibilities that inhere in the idea of it. Thus and so, the dissident is the real patriot. Furthermore, Janus faced democracies, never averse to flexing authoritarian control, are also aware of the necessity of broadcasting an image of benign indulgence when de dealing with dissident voices. While on the one hand, acts of civil disobedience can both challenge and reinvigorate alliances of political, of political agonism, on the other, a stride democratic tolerance states are also capable of effectively confining the dissident voice to a proscenium of orchestrated effects and encounters, emptying it of all political acuity. What remains thus of individual imperatives towards political interventions and dissidents could always already be thwartively predicated upon co-option and its insidious closures. That the cunning of democracy can commodify and stare down things defang and domesticate the dissident voice and relegatively granted the impotence of a pet lion is a flagging that the critical imaginary of resistance movements has also been alert to. Conscious of this and the allowance made for voices like hers in the new market-friendly democracy that is India, there is a candid reflexivity that Roy brings to her political interventions. As she says, quote, they say, oh, we have this great cricket batsman, Sachin Tendulkar, and we have Miss Universe, Aishwarya Rai, and we have this writer, Arundhati Roy. And you know, everything is telescoped as a kind of, look at all the things that we have on display. And we're a democracy, so we uh, allow her to say these things, you know, and they get on with that. Roy's offensives are launched from the vantage of the small, and her poetic, impressionistic, aesthetic gestures at spectres even while not quite attempting to define, demonstrate and occupy politics as warfare. In this, there are connections that have been drawn with the anarchism of Chomsky, an old friend and one with whom she shares a deep mutual admiration. Seen in their vocal criticism of American policies in Iraq and Afghanistan and also its pushing of a larger global neoliberal agenda. Closer in her politics to the 
horizontalist emphasis of the Occupy movements and the preoccupations of the democratic left, an individualist vanguardism impels her anarchism as tactic. Additionally, as politics, it also rides on Roy's indictment of the histories of the parliamentary left in India, evident in the distancing that has leavened her writing since, since The God of Small Things. She cites the doctrinal impoverishment of the left as the real failure of our times, one that has in its wake flattened all ideological battles into what she terms as lifestyle wars, wars de-radicalized and fought only to preserve and enhance the delicate pleasures and exquisite comforts of a chosen few. Yet, despite these imputations, Roy maintains with Hall, quote, I have plenty of Marxism in me, unquote, a contention that structures and coheres the methodology and thrust of her resistant acts. These acts are positioned as individual impulses and isolated campaigns, drawing them into the blunted, unveiling politics of the anti-communist, radical, cosmopolitan intelligentsia and often dismissed for the rhetoric of left posturing in the name of postmodern resistance that they indulge in. This especially so when, in light of the Goliathan majesty and fury that has propped her politics upon the personal and the subjective. As she says, quote, the dismantling of the big, big bombs, big dams, big ideologies, big contradictions, big countries, big wars, big heroes, big mistakes. Perhaps it will be the century of the small." Unquote. As field notes on democracy, Arundhati Roy's writings ally with the estranged, the marginal, the Agambenian homo sacer, the unconsoled as a dedication to her second novel, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness testifies. Individuals and groups whose broken dreams unconstitute the ideals of the Republic. While in her writings on groups disenfranchised and disavowed by the state, the idiom and claim and the fight for rights is discursively plumbed from the constitutional charter of the Republic, in her vocal assertions on the Kashmiri's right to self-determination, it is the secessionist demand, the ceding from the Republic, she lends support to. She has, in the last two decades, followed the Kashmiri struggle and also reflectively assessed the impasses within different political claims with a nuancing that attests her affective investment with criticality. That the futures of a free Kashmir could come warped of pristine ideals is also a possibility that she acknowledges. As she says, quote, It is for the people of Kashmir to agree or disagree with the Islamic project which is as contested in equally complex ways all over the world by Muslims as Hindutva is contested by Hindus, unquote. And, quote, an independent Kashmiri nation may be a flawed entity, but is independent India perfect? Are we not asking Kashmiris the same question that our old colonial masters asked us? Are the natives ready for freedom? Unquote. Further, the political volatility of utterances like what does freedom mean to Kashmiris? Why can't it be discussed? Have quite predictably in these right regressive times earned her the tag of anti-national. The anti-national descriptor, ably aided by the charge of sedition, is in the current shift mobilized against any form of criticism of the government and its policies. One that Roy quite aptly references, as she says, quote, in better days that used to be known as a critical perspective or an alternative worldview. These days in India, it's called sedition." Unquote. In a nation that believes in invoking a hegemonic conscience of Kashmir, Roy structures subversive registers pitched against its nationalistic demands. Instances like a petition on Change ORG, urging the government to revoke her citizenship, or a film actor who is also a member of parliament, his fulminations demand that she be tied as a shield on a counter-insurgency combat vehicle in Kashmir are all typical of the rabid responses her interventions have invoked. Roy's combative relationship with the Indian state has a history that sees her challenging both the BJP, which is currently in power, as well as the previous party, the Congress. Along with her searing criticism of the right, 
she had also alienated the left earlier by showing the grand patriarch and ideologue of the party in an unflattering light in her novel The God of Small Things. She has also been critical of the state's response to insurgent radical left groups called Maoists or Naxalites in India, although the political term is itself questionable as she says, quote, they have a history of resistance which predates Mao, unquote. For a long essay published in 2010, Walking with Comrades, she had spent time in the jungles with the rebels. As she says, here we have the poorest, most malnourished waging a war against the corporates supported by all the institution of the world's biggest democracy." Unquote. She sees the insurgents' use of violence as a corollary to the battle between the tribals and corporate houses to gain control over natural resources like minerals, water and forests, saying, quote, what the government calls Maoist corridor is in fact MOUist corridor. You have an MOU on every mountain, river, MOU signed by biggest corporations in the world who are waiting to gain hold of the resources." Unquote. And yet she is also uh, willing a critical understanding that acknowledges that perhaps on coming to power the Maoists too could be, as she says, brutal, unjust and autocratic or even worse than the present government. Unquote. Quite predictably, a simultaneous assault of sound and fury from both the left and the right of the political spectrum has greeted the political positions that she has taken. There is in Roy's writing a recall, a combative outrage. As she says, it can't go on like this. Something will arise either out of complete destruction or some kind of revolution, but it can't go on like this." Unquote. And her work and her voice stand as significant attempts at reworking the cognitive limits of dissidents in the contemporary moment. At a time when the organized Indian left has been ideologically evacuated into electoral opportunisms and forms of major, uh, majoritarian consensus and varieties of right-wing populism have come to occupy the substance and structure of politics, Roy has consistently represented the undersides of a national conscience. In this, her battles against party dispensations and even the courts of law indeed stand out as exercises in imagining a polity outside of the historically misdirected social democratic project of nation building and its attendant structures of political legitimacy. The recipient of many prizes, even after the booker, Roy had continued to donate the prize money to rights activists and grassroots organizations. Her essays are for the most part readily available online with no attempt made to preserve copyright. In effect, Roy has ensured that her work as an activist is not professionalized, not be seen as an opportunistic profiting of the adulation that continues coming her way. Straddling her trenchant critiques is a deep romanticism and faith in the possibility of change, evident also in the titles of her two novels, the God of Small Things and the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, that underwrite a hope sinewed and kept past the obvious wrenching ironies that events and lives in her novels are culled from. As she famously says, quote, another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing, unquote.